In this video, we're going to look at uh, factors that uh, result in uh, deterioration of even uh, we refer to as spoilage of food. And we'll talk uh, briefly about that control. Certainly, as we look at uh, food preservation throughout the semester, uh, one of the things that uh, food preservation methods uh, do is uh, they either prevent or slow down those factors that result in uh, spoilage of the food or those factors that would uh, make that food uh, a food safety concern. So if we look at sort of a definition, uh, as we look at a definition of deterioration, uh, we might say that it's any adverse change uh, on a food's attributes uh, from an agreed upon uh, measure of quality. And certainly uh, this can vary uh, among populations, cultures, and uh, individuals, and uh, a, r a really good place to see how this might uh, be different is if one goes to the Travel Channel and looks at uh, the presentations done by Andrew Zimmerman, and certainly uh, some of the foods that he, he eats, uh, certainly some of us might consider those foods uh, to be uh, deteriorated or to the point where one would not eat them, but certainly uh, other individu an individual basis or uh, in particular populations or cultures, uh, those foods certainly are acceptable and uh, are eaten uh, on a regular basis. So what kind of factors can cause deterioration, uh, certainly, of foods? And certainly as we go throughout the semester looking at uh, methods of preservation, we'll be uh, dealing with methods that actually uh, in some ways are related to factors that can cause deterioration. Uh, certainly heat and or cold can cause uh, loss of quality or deterioration of food products. But again, uh, these are methods certainly that can be used for food preservation. Uh, light and, and other radiation, uh, oxygen, moisture and or dryness. Uh, in some instances we certainly use these as preservation methods. Uh, certainly in other instances one certainly uh, would look at those as a uh, means of uh, deterioration or loss of quality of the food product. Uh, food enzymes that are found naturally uh, in that particular food product, uh, particularly as we look at fruits and vegetables in particular. Uh, certainly uh, micro and macro organisms, and we'll spend uh, a fair amount of time looking at these. Uh, industrial contaminants, and certainly uh, over time uh, all food products uh, tend to have uh, certainly a loss in quality and maybe some deterioration. Uh, certainly if one looks at food trivia, one of the food trivia questions that are is often asked is what is the only food uh, that never spoils, and uh, the answer typically has been honey. Uh, commonly, various degrees of preservation were accomplished actually long before an understanding of the principles were known. And the question that I asked you, can you, uh, you provide at least two examples of uh, methods that we use for food preservation, certainly well before we actually understood the science or the principles behind how they actually worked. Uh, we're going to spend a fair amount of time looking at uh, microorganisms, bacteria, yeast, moles, and protozoa, uh, because they are frequently uh, certainly a major cause of food spoilage. Uh, they're certainly uh, related to, uh, to a great degree uh, to uh, food safety, uh, particularly as we look at uh, pathogenic uh, food microorganisms. Uh, the mechanisms of action by which uh, certainly uh, bacteria, yeast, moles, and protozoa cause uh, spoilage of food is that they actually contain enzymes that can actually uh, attack all the food constituents. Uh, some have glycosidases which would uh, attack carbohydrates, uh, some have lipases that would attack the, the lipid uh, certainly portion of the food, and then they also have proteases <coughs> which can uh, attack and uh, metabolize proteins. And certainly many of these have would have all three of uh, these types of, of enzymes or classes of enzymes. Uh, you certainly uh, should have been exposed uh, to this if you've taken a food microbiology class, but uh, there are several environmental factors certainly which affect the growth of microorganisms uh, in or on a food product, uh, moisture certainly being one of those. And we talk about water, uh, moisture as it relates to uh, growth of microorganisms in or on food products. We refer to water activity, certainly bacteria. 
uh, will grow nicely at water activities of uh, 0.85 and above, uh, yeast 0.75 and above, and then moles, which can grow at the certainly the lowest level of water activity, 0.60 and above. And water activity is defined, as you know, as P over P sub zero. It's the, the vapor pressure of the solute uh, divided by the vapor pressure of pure water uh, at the same temperature. So that's the key point. Uh, they need to be measured at the same temperature. And I'm sure those of you who are working uh, in the uh, food science area, uh, even certainly the nutrition area, probably are familiar with uh, water activity meter, which we have several uh, in uh, the school. And these certainly are used to give us some insight into the water activity of a particular food product and how that might relate uh, to uh, spoilage or deterioration of that food product and what methods of preservation may need to be used to ensure that the product maintains its quality and, uh, and all food safety. Uh, some examples in the next several slides I'm not going to go into in any detail. They're from a presentation from Bashots at IFT in 2002, and they just give you some insight into water activity levels and which uh, microorganisms uh, may be able to grow at those particular water activity levels. And they give you a range of water activity levels, uh, and they're the minimum water activity for growth of microorganisms. Uh, they give you microorganisms inhibited by the lowest water activity in this range and then the foods generally uh, within this range. And this was a, a really a good slide as a reference slide. Uh, it gives you some insight into which microorganisms may proliferate at a particular uh, water activity and uh, then uh, those can then be related either to uh, loss of quality or food spoilage deterioration and or food safety as well. And I'm not going to spend a great deal of time with these. Uh, certainly there are several of these slides, but uh, they are there for you to use and to get into some insight into uh, water activity. And again, we get down into the lower ranges. Certainly many of the yeast can grow. Uh, as we get down, uh, certainly uh, blow uh, 0 0.870 down to 0 0.850, uh, the major, at least uh, primarily the only uh, food pathogen that we're concerned with in this in this water activity range would be Staph aureus. And then we get down to 0.87 to 0 0.80 and again uh, as we get down into to very very low levels uh, we're seeing that uh, most of certainly the food spoilage microorganisms, uh, particularly if we look at bacteria, uh, typically will not grow except maybe some uh, salt loving bacteria foods that are generally within this range are jam and marmalade and certainly those of you who are familiar with and have made your own jam and marmalade know that typically the the only way that jam and marmalade would actually spoil is through the uh, growth actually of mold uh, on the surface of that jam and marmalade. Uh, this occurs when uh, the jar is opened and oxygen is actually able to get in the surface of that jam and or marmalade. And then we get down to some very, very low ranges, and again, uh, nothing for you to, to know for an exam, but it just provides you some uh, information that might be useful uh, at a further date uh, as you get out to, to work in industry or as you're teaching perhaps a food microbiology class. And then we get down 0.3 to 0.2, there's uh, no microbial proliferation typically. Uh, these are products that are, are very, very dry in nature. So what are some other environmental factors besides uh, moisture or water activity? Well, certainly temperature and microorganisms are uh, classified into uh, various groups based on the uh, optimum temperature for the growth. We have uh, psychrophiles whose optimum growth temperatures are typically between 0 and 15 centigrade, uh, psychrotropes. Uh, typically, their uh, optimum growth is at uh, higher temperatures, 20 to 30 C, but uh, they can grow well, some of them certainly at 7 degrees C. Uh, mesophiles, those that grow well at room temperature, uh, 14, uh, 16 to 45 C. Uh, the thing about uh, mesophiles is that it includes uh, almost all of uh, those uh, pathogenic microorganisms that we'd certainly be concerned with in our own food products. Uh, thermophiles, which can grow at very, very high temperatures, uh, 46 to 60 C. And a question that I like to ask uh, is, can canned foods spoil uh, even if properly processed? And uh, 
clarify this a little more, can they spoil microbiologically? And this is to state that they've been properly processed through the canning operation. Uh, is it possible for uh, that products and those products certainly to spoil? Uh, environmental factors again that can another factor is the atmosphere surrounding the foods and typically we classify them as aerobes that will grow only in the presence of oxygen, uh, anaerobes uh, that will grow only in uh, the absence of oxygen, uh, facultative which will grow uh, either or and again uh, many of the food pathogens, foodborne pathogens fall into the facultative group and microaerophilic. Uh, they are aerobes that grow better under slightly reduced conditions and this would include certainly the lactobacilli and we will be discussing the lactobacilli in greater detail when we talk about food fermentation. pH uh, is also another factor and the question that I ask you is how does pH affect the growth of microorganisms? So we'll look at it, food safety a little bit. Uh, certainly this gives us a, an opportunity at the beginning of this class uh, before we go into food preservation methods, uh, not only to look at uh, deterioration of the food, but to, to look at food safety as it relates to presence uh, of foodborne pathogens in or on the food product. Uh, questions we might ask certainly uh, is what is food safety? And certainly there are, in addition to microbial issues, uh, organisms involved in food safety, certainly there are chemicals as well uh, that uh, one could discuss related to food safety. How safe is the U.S. food supply? And who regulates the U.S. food supply? So we're going to briefly look at microorganisms. We're going to look at bacteria, yeast, molds, and protozoa. Uh, their occurrence and significance of foodborne illness. Uh, there are some terms, certainly, that if you've taken food microbiology uh, that have been defined for you, I think you might just need to review these. Uh, foodborne diseases, any disease transmitted by food, uh, through food, and this includes not only microorganisms, but it could be chemicals, uh, uh, physical uh, hazards as well uh, that could be responsible for a foodborne disease, uh, things such as uh, foodborne toxins, uh, as well as uh, heavy metals that might be in or on the food product, uh, pesticide residues uh, above the tolerance that is approved by EPA for them, uh, microbial foodborne intoxication. This is a, an illness caused by ingestion of a toxin that's formed by the bacteria before the food is, is eaten, and certainly uh, Staph aureus and Clostridium botulinum are the, the two major ones certainly uh, that are, are, are cause of uh, microbial foodborne intoxication. We have microbial food infection and this is actually caused where you actually consume uh, the food with the live microorganism. Uh, it invades, grows, and subsequently will damage uh, the host tissue. Uh, the, a really good example perhaps of this would be uh, certainly salmonella. And then we have uh, a foodborne, uh, microbial foodborne toxin mediated infection and my uh, question for you is can you provide a definition of this and can you provide an example uh, of a food that might be involved uh, with that particular microorganism or uh, foodborne pathogen being present. So if we look at CDC in 2011, um, they don't change these values very often. Uh, for about 10 years they had different values and finally in 2011 they came out with the, the latest numbers that they use in related to U.S. foodborne diseases and they estimate about 48 million illnesses per year and this would include about one in six Americans. Uh, 128,000 hospitalization, hospitalizations a year as a result of foodborne disease and approximately 3,000 people each year die as a result of foodborne diseases and in most instances these are going to be uh, bacterial in nature. So if we look at outbreaks, and certainly a large number of outbreaks of E. coli 0157H7 and leafy green vegetables have occurred since 1965. We're continu continuing to see this. We've seen a lot actually over the past two or three months uh, with O21 uh, being uh, the foodborne pathogen. And 
links in between E. coli found in vegetables uh, and nearby cattle ranches. And certainly a question for you to, to think about is what should the distance be between a vegetable production and a dairy operation? Uh, the concern here certainly is actually the manure that's uh, produced by uh, the cows and the fact that a certain percentage, a very low percentage certainly of all cows and all calves actually uh, have uh, E. coli 5787 uh, in their uh, gut system. And these certainly are uh, excreted uh, with the manure and then they can move by groundwater certainly uh, or by rainwater to a place where uh, vegetables uh, certainly or even fruits such as strawberries are being uh, produced. Uh, imported cucumbers, uh, Salmonella puna, 38 states with 838 cases and four deaths in 2015. Uh, certainly uh, many of you probably are familiar with the Chipotle Mexican Grill, uh, sugar toxin producing E. coli 026. Uh, this occurred in nine states uh, with 53 cases. Uh, certainly had uh, an eco a large economic impact certainly on Chipotle. Uh, Costco rotisserie chicken salad, E. coli 15787, uh, it happened in seven states uh, with 19 cases, uh, bag salad, listeria in 2016, and certainly uh, there have been a number in the last three or four months uh, re related to uh, both E. coli 15787, E. coli 021, uh, as well as listeria, um, associated with a, a number of products, flour being one, uh, certainly, uh, and, and a number of recalls. So how are we doing uh, as we look at controlling uh, foodborne pathogens in the food supply? Well, if we look at uh, changes in incidence of laboratory confirmed bacterial infections, this is 2013 data, uh, we can see that uh, things like Campylobacter, uh, Listeria, um, Salmonella, or Shigella were up. Uh, we look at uh, Yersinia, Vibrio, again, uh, we see increases, uh, we see, excuse me, a decrease in Listeria and Salmonella with decreases in uh, the other uh, major foodborne pathogens that we uh, find in the food supply. Uh, you certainly can find uh, more recent data. Uh, if you want to look at uh, CDC morb morbidity and mortality weekly reports, uh, provide some very good information. Uh, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention as well, CDC. Uh, I have a website here to CDC where you can uh, find information certainly on foodborne illness and certainly the USDA and FDA uh, websites will also provide information. Uh, I get a daily report uh, from the FDA related to uh, food recalls on food products uh, that allows me to keep up with information related to the foods uh, that are currently uh, in the recall process and they tell you why they're being recalled. Um, major two uh, causes right now that you see are either for the potential for the presence uh, of foodborne pathogens uh, and or uh, undeclared allergens on the label. Those are the two really big areas. Uh, food safety and cheap ingredients. Uh, are we rolling back prices on food safety? This was from 2007. And it's related to uh, Dr. Mike Dalton Do Doyle at the University of Georgia, who's one of the uh, world's foremost authorities on microbial food safety, and uh, certainly some of his concern certainly has been for uh, imported food ingredients that are being used in food products. Uh, the last slide that I will show you with this presentation will provide some information on one particular product and where all of the ingredients used in manufacturing that product may potentially come from. Uh, it's it's kind of enlightening, actually, to, to see that, I think. So we've talked about traditional, non-traditional foodborne pathogens. How are they different? What should you know? Well, you should know examples, certainly, of foodborne pathogens, both traditional and non-traditional. Uh, the type of foodborne illness that's caused by uh, that particular uh, microorganism. Uh, the major foods associated with the illness whether they're aerobe, anaerobe, or facultative, and whether they're a spore former or non spore former. Now, if you're not familiar with spore formers and non spore formers, uh, I would urge you to certainly go uh, to a food microbiology uh, biology text. Uh, certainly, you can find this information online as well. 
uh, traditional microbial foodborne pathogens, one of the major ones certainly is salmonella. And the, the interesting thing about salmonella certainly is there are over 1,200 species of salmonella, and a, a, any one of these actually can cause a foodborne illness. Uh, it's a facultative microorganism, uh, a non spore former. Uh, it causes gastroenteritis. Uh, incubation times uh, can vary certainly. Uh, from six to 48 hours, and the duration, uh, depending on the severity of the case, can be three to five days. Now, you don't need to know that particular information, but you certainly should know that it's a facultative non spore former and that the major foods that we have uh, found associated with salmonella are poultry and eggs, but more recently, we've seen a lot, certainly, of cases of salmonella associated with uh, certainly uh, fruits and vegetables. Uh, a number of recalls, certainly, over the last year or two uh, that were related to fruits and vegetables, uh, also nuts as well. Uh, Clostridium perfringens, uh, this is a toxin-mediated infection. Uh, Clostridium is a true anaerobe. It is a spore former. There are six serotypes of uh, Clostridium perfringens, A through F. Uh, the incubation time is 9 to 15 hours, and the duration typically for Clostridium perfringens is about 24 hours. And it's very often uh, associated with uh, steam table foods kept below. It says 140, but if you go to the latest food code, and this was actually changed in the 2013 food code, that foods held on steam tables now can be held at 135 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so if the temperature uh, gets below 135 degrees, there is certainly the potential uh, for Clostridium uh, perfringens spores to outgrow in that product and produce toxin. Staphylococcus aureus, uh, this is a food intoxication. In other words, the uh, preformed toxin is in the food uh, prior to the time that the food is consumed. Uh, it's facultative. Uh, it doesn't compete well with normal uh, spoilage flora. So one of the major uh, places that we actually get uh, contamination with Staphylococcus aureus is actually from uh, food workers and the contamination occurs after the food product uh, may have been cooked and processed. Uh, this particular organism can grow at uh, lower water activities. Uh, it likes high sugar and high salt foods. Uh, the toxin in this case is heat stable, so once the toxin is there, recooking or reheating the food will not destroy it. Uh, it causes gastroenteritis. Uh, the incubation time it can be very, very quick, depending on certainly the amount of toxin that might be present in that food at the time of consumption, from 30 minutes to 8 hours, and the duration is 1 to 2 hours. Uh, some of the foods, uh, parasites, uh, uh, excuse me, pastries with cream fillings and fermented meats, also certainly ham has been one of the, the certainly the major uh, places we found Staph aureus. Uh, Staph aureus produces projectile vomiting, which uh, if you have projectile vomiting, you can almost be certain in the on current currents of the, uh, of the uh, foodborne illnesses very rapidly after eating the product, you can almost be assured that it's a result of Staph toxin. Uh, Crostridium botulinum, uh, the adult type, is a food intoxication. Uh, there is a uh, child form or an infant form of Crostridium botulinum, typically been associated with honey. It's an anaerobic spore former. There are six stereotypes. A, B, E, and F have caused foodborne illness in humans. Uh, it's a neurotoxin. There's a high mortality rate, particularly for to toxin A. And the foods that uh, have been associated with Clostridium botulinum, uh, and again, uh, this is a preformed toxin that we find in the product uh, prior to consumption of seafood, vacuum packaged, temperature abused, uh, low acid canned foods, under processed low acid canned foods. Um, don't see a lot of cases of Clostridium botulinum in foods that have been uh, processed commercially uh, because of the regulations related uh, to low acid canned food processing. Uh, one area we have seen potential outbreaks of Clostridium botulinum is with, uh, at least type E, is with uh, vacuum package, temperature abuse seafood products, especially smoke products. Uh, also, some people have done and processed and smoked and brined fish with the uh, internal organs uh, in them. They haven't been eviscerated, and uh, that is not allowed uh, under ASAP regulations. But in some instances, those products have been associated with uh, outbreak of Clostridium botulinum. Uh, two company recalls for canned foods in 2007, and they have been under-processed. And this is probably the 
one of the two of the most recent, actually, uh, commercial uh, recalls for products, Castleberry Foods for canned chili products, in which there were four suspected cases, and Lakeside Foods with canned French green beans. There were no reported cases, although they were under process, so there was a potential for that. There were also two cases in Aroostook County uh, a number of years ago that were associated with uh, home processed uh, spaghetti sauce. Bacillus cirrus uh, is again a facultative and it is a spore former. There are type, two types. Type 1 is the diarrheal type and uh, it occurs 6 to 15 hours after consumption of meats, vegetable dishes, milk. And the type 2 is an emetic type. An emetic uh, is a type where vomiting would be one of the major certainly symptoms. And it occurs very rapidly uh, after consumption uh, of fried, broiled, or cooked rice uh, and other starchy foods. Some of the, the major outbreaks of Bacillus cirrus have been actually associated with cooked rice. Uh, Campylobacter jejuni is a, an emerging pathogen. Uh, it's an aerobe that causes a food infection, so you're eating and consuming a food with a live microorganism. Uh, gastrointestinal, uh, gastroenteritis with uh, muscle pain. Uh, the incubation time for this particular uh, product uh, or particular pathogen is, can be very, very long. It be, may be very difficult if it's a long incubation time to actually determine which food was responsible. And uh, the duration can be quite significant for this. It's typically been associated with animal and seafood sources. And uh, some recent research has uh, indicated that uh, may attach to biofilms of other bacteria. Uh, it makes it very hard to remove, particularly from food contact surfaces. And it can result in a, a rare uh, autoimmune disease called Guillain-Barre syndrome, and number one case uh, cause of, uh, of foodborne illness in the United States. Uh, if we look at biofilms, many bacteria ca can form them uh, as colonies of bacteria that are encased in sticky substance and they adhere to the surface and can be uh, very, very difficult to remove. Uh, for Campylobacter jejuni, it's often associated with uh, colonies of Pseudomonas. Uh, further emerging pathogens, uh, E. coli 157H7 and also uh, hemorrhagic E. coli. Uh, it's a facultative anaerobe, uh, it causes a food infection. Uh, one of the major uh, concerns certainly is with uh, hemolytic, uh, hemolytic urea, uh, uremic syndrome. Uh, the incubation time is three to four days and the duration can be up to ten days. Uh, the importance of particularly E. coli 157A7 is it can uh, survive even though it may not grow under acidic conditions. And a question you might ask, what is the implication of this as it relates uh, to uh, food processing, food preservation? Uh, foods, uh, animal tissue, three to two to three percent of all cattle are carriers. Uh, unpasteurized pasteurized fruit and vegetable juices certainly have been implicated, and again, fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, more recently, uh, certainly a number of cases. Uh, certainly, the other hemorrhagic uh, E. coli have also uh, been implicated in foodborne illness outbreaks. O one O three H two uh, was found in an outbreak in Japan where they had 9,500 cases with 11 deaths. In 2011, the USDA uh, expended, uh, extended the zero tolerance policy to include six additional strains of E. coli non, uh, as, as non-0157 shiga toxin producing, uh, 016, uh, excuse me, 026, 0103, 045, 011, uh, 0121, and 0145. Mm -hmm. And certainly, uh, the FSIS uh, in March of 2012, and they continue to test for these other uh, strains of E. coli. Vibrio cholera, parahemolyticus and lignificans, uh, these are facultative uh, anaerobes, uh, they cause a food infection. Uh, typical symptoms would be abdominal cramps, diarrhea, fever, and occasional death. And the major foods they're associated with, they certainly on cooking will destroy these uh, vibrio fairly easily. Uh, raw or under-processed shellfish, marine fish, and crustaceans. So those of us who consume uh, sushi or sashimi, uh, there's always certainly the potential uh, for vibrio species, uh, particularly uh, uh, parahemolyticus and vulnificans. And for some reason, the death rate for vulnificans is higher in uh, men than it is in women. Uh, another one of certainly major concern is Listeria monocytogenes. Uh, it's a facultative anaerobe because of a food infection. Uh, typical, uh, 
typical symptoms would be flu-like symptoms, but uh, certainly uh, in pregnant women it can cause spontaneous abortion and stillbirth, which makes it a, a product of a pathogen of major concern. It was originally isolated from uh, dairy products, processed meat, seafood. Uh, it is found extensively in the environment. Uh, the U.S. has zero tolerance in food products. Uh, question certainly we can think about why zero tolerance and is this realistic? Uh, other countries in the world uh, do not necessarily have zero tolerance uh, for uh, the steromonocytogenes in our own food products. Uh, 2000 2008, the FDA had two guidance documents uh, for public comment, uh, compliance policy guide uh, guidance for FDA staff, and a guidance for industry for control of Listeria monocytogenase in refrigerated or frozen ready to eat foods. And certainly, uh, another concern with Listeria monocytogenase is it tends to be able to grow in refrigerated food products. Uh, it tends to be able to grow uh, in those maybe at a very, very slow rate, but uh, it can be present. And products uh, that are of major concern is if we get uh, recontamination or post-process contamination of food products, uh, particularly looking at uh, processed meat products would be an example. Uh, Yersinia intercalatica, a facultative anaerobe, causes food infection. Uh, incubation time is 24 to 48 hours, uh, duration of a few days, uh, diarrhea and or vomiting. vomiting. Uh, causes uh, symptoms that are similar to appendicitis and is sometimes called uh, pseudoappendicitis. And the foods that have been implicated are raw or rare meat and poultry, raw milk, and milk products made from raw milk. Uh, another one that's certainly a uh, concern with uh, those of you who may at some point in time have very young infants is enterobacteria such as Sakazuki. Uh, it's a food infection. The symptoms can be meningitis, enterocoloticus, lyticus, or sepsis. Uh, the primary target is infants and powdered infant formula, uh, particularly that may not have been processed at a high enough temperature uh, to ensure uh, that the uh, particular foodborne pathogen is concerned, uh, can, uh, killed. Uh, when we look at uh, liquid uh, formulas, certainly they are canned uh, and they reach high enough temperatures, but if we use uh, spray drying uh, as a method for producing these, there may be the potential that the temperature is not high enough to particularly uh, destroy this foodborne pathogen. And the mortality rate uh, of 30 to 80 percent, even with antibiotic treatment. Uh, viruses certainly can be a, a, another cause of uh, food deterioration and foodborne illness. Uh, like hepatitis A can cause fever and abdominal discomfort, followed by jaundice. Uh, Norwalk like virus, uh, this is a, a major one certainly. Uh, see all kinds of outbreaks of foodborne illness on cruise ships uh, where it uh, certainly affects many, many uh, members of perhaps of the crew as well as those people on the ship. Uh, what is the definition of a virus and what are some ways that a food might become contaminated? Uh, things for you to think about. And uh, where have the major outbreaks occurred in the last three years uh, with Norwalk virus? I gave you certainly uh, one particular place where they've occurred and that happens to be cruise ships. Can you think of others as well? Uh, prions, uh, what is the concern and what foods have been implicated with prions, prions? We haven't heard very much about them since the early mad cow uh, outbreaks, uh, certainly, uh, but uh, something you should be familiar with and, and have some knowledge of, certainly. Uh, protozoa uh, certainly can uh, cause uh, food uh, deterioration and certainly also been associated with the foodborne illness outbreaks. Uh, both cryptosporidium and cyclospora associated with fresh fruits and vegetables and certainly the contamination was probably as a result of water and it may certainly have been uh, groundwater that was used for irrigation. Uh, Giardia lamblia is another one certainly uh, found in water also referred to as beaver fever. Uh, insects, parasites, and rodents uh, not only can cause uh, spoilage and deterioration of food as a result of the actual food that's being consumed and lost by them, and it's estimated that about 5 to 10 percent of the annual uh, grain crop is destroyed by insects, parasites, and rodents, as well as the loss of fruits and vegetables. 
Um, recent research has demonstrated that insects can harbor pathogenic microorganisms, uh, flies and roaches. There's some pretty good evidence out there, some pretty good papers published that uh, looks at uh, flies and roaches and looks at the gut contents and the fact that they can isolate uh, foodborne pathogens uh, from uh, these uh, particular insects. Uh, regulations exist regarding insects and insects of parts uh, allowed in food products, uh, defect action levels they're referred to. So there are food products in which we can find insect, a number of insect and insect parts and uh, those products can still be sold. We talk about those in more detail when we uh, talk about food law. So uh, defect action levels, uh, some examples for you, uh, shell peanuts can have 20 insects uh, per 100 pounds. Uh, golden raisins may contain up to 35 uh, fly eggs per 8 ounces. Uh, popcorn can have uh, two rodent hairs or 20 gnawed kernels per pound. And blueberries, uh, three uh, blueberry maggots per can. And these numbers can be lowered as uh, new processing methods, uh, preservation methods come online that will actually allow for a reduction uh, in these numbers. Uh, certainly roaches uh, are of major concern. Uh, and uh, if you've ever uh, had roaches in your home, uh, certainly they're very, very difficult uh, certainly to control. Uh, parasites are more of a problem in the U.S. in the last 10 to 15 years, and my question to you is why? Uh, what are six, some examples? Certainly there are three major types of parasitic worms that we deal with, roundworms, nematodes, and tapeworms, uh, cestodes, uh, flukes, uh, which are trematodes. So we have nematodes, cestodes, and trematodes, which are the, the major three type of parasitic worms. Uh, Asicaris uh, lambricoides is an example, and this uh, shows you what that particular uh, parasite would look like in terms of a worm. And you can see the female is larger than the male, um, probably about the uh, diameter, that can be up to certainly uh, a foot long, and diameter are very similar to say the angel hair pasta perhaps uh, would be a good example. Uh, it causes inter intestinal and lung infection. Uh, very often, we, we can certainly find these uh, in uh, fish. Uh, Diphyloborthrum uh, latum is a freshwater tapeworm. It can be up to three to seven feet long. And might ask why would certainly this be a problem? And uh, example you have to think about is you need to think about uh, uh, salmon and uh, the life cycle of a salmon. Anisacus simplex is a roundworm found in saltwater fish. Uh, you probably have bought codfish and a sole in the supermarket. Uh, I doubt if you ever see uh, an Anisacus simplex, a parasite, a roundworm in that product. But if you go out fishing and go deep sea fishing and you catch your own fish, uh, say cod or sole, uh, Play them yourself, uh, depending on where they were caught, oftentimes you will see the roundworms uh, in these species in the fillets. Uh, typically they lie around uh, and near the backbone. Uh, product that's sold in the supermarket uh, has been candled uh, prior to uh, during the processing operation. If they were present, th those roundworms would be removed. Uh, certainly not a concern if you are uh, cooking uh, the fish fillets. Uh, since they would be killed and would be certainly a good source of protein. Um, but certainly if we're consuming raw or under-processed uh, fish, then they could become an issue. Uh, Trichinella sprillis, uh, in what food is this parasite a problem? Uh, product that's processed in uh, slaughterhouses in the U.S. not really a problem today. Uh, certainly there is a, a wild species of animal where uh, Trichinella sprillis can be an issue. Uh, and one would need to be very, very careful, certainly, in cooking uh, that particular meat. Rodents uh, certainly are a dual problem. They consume food, so we have an economic loss in this regard, and then they contaminate uh, the food. Uh, it can be a source of diseases, either from urine or feces, etc. And can you give some examples? Uh, natural food enzymes, these are enzymes that are in the food product. Uh, certainly the activity is intensified uh, after harvest and slaughter, and my question to you is why is that the case? 
Uh, certainly living cells contain the enzymes necessary for the total catabolism of the cell and its contents, and this includes proteases, lipases, glycosidases, uh, phenylases, RNases, DNases, so the, the cell itself does contain enzymes that would allow uh, that cell to be broken down into individual components. Uh, heat and cold is a general rule within the moderate temperature range over which much food is handled. Uh, for every 10 degrees C rise in temperature, the rate of chemical reactions, both enzymatic and non-enzymatic, is approximately doubled. Uh, so this certainly can lead to spoilage and deterioration of food products, although, as I said earlier, uh, heat and cold are also used as methods of food preservation that we'll be talking about uh, during the, the semester. Uh, deterioration that's associated with heat, uh, you have protein denaturation, you can have destruction and loss of an emulsion, uh, dehydration, and certainly in some cases we want to dehydrate the food product as a method of preservation. There are other instances where we certainly do not want uh, dehydration of that product. And certainly it can result in destruction of vitamins, particularly some of the B vitamins and vitamin C. Uh, if we look at cold, uh, we can have a loss of textual properties uh, as it goes through freeze-thaw cycles. And certainly there are starches, modified starches, that have been used to uh, prevent the loss of texture properties uh, in uh, product that is being sold frozen, this particularly we're looking at gravies. And again, uh, this is a, a deterioration and a loss of quality. It's certainly not related to uh, any uh, foodborne uh, illness. Emulsion destruction and then certainly discoloration. Air uh, deterioration that's been associated with air is destruction of vitamins, uh, which ones? Uh, microbial growth, as I said, most spoilage microorganisms are aerobes, but most foodborne pathogens are facultative. Rancidity development as it relates to uh, breakdown of lipids, uh, both enzymatic and non-enzymatic, and then color changes that can occur as a result of the presence of oxygen. Light uh, deterioration has been associated with light, include vitamin loss, again, which once uh, color loss, color fading, which is certainly related to the quality loss in the food product. Uh, flavor changes, uh, certainly it can promote oxidation. And time, uh, all of the previous mentioned deteriorative conditions are time dependent. And certainly for most foods, quality decreases uh, with time. And a major goal certainly of food scientists as we uh, look to develop food preservation methods is to main qu maintain quality through the normal uh, storage uh, life of that particular food product. And certainly what are some examples of food products that actually do improve with age? And certainly there are some that do. And this concludes the presentation looking at uh, food deterioration.